outdoor air pollution. These slides will help you understand outdoor air pollution, smog, acid rain, and anti-pollution laws and technology. London's 1952 killer smog, amazing day. A thick smog settled on London, killing 4,000 to 12,000 people. That's a lot to die in one day just because of air quality. It was caused by weather conditions that exacerbated the city's air pollution from factories and homes burning coal. And this and other events led Britain to pass clean air laws and other countries followed suit. There can also be natural sources of air pollution like these dust storms that we see off the coast of Africa, volcanic eruptions and fires. Artificial sources of air pollution are more troublesome for us. Human pollution or human caused air pollution includes point sources which are specific spots where large amounts of pollution are discharged, such as this factory smokestack you see, and non-point sources, which are diffuse, often made up of many small sources, like these cars on the freeway. Which of the following are secondary pollutants? This is multiple mark. Go ahead and pause. Okay, welcome back. If you said B and D, you're correct. Sulfuric acid is H2SO4 that forms from the reaction of SOX or sulfur oxides with H2O. So SOX would be the primary pollutant, sulfuric acid the secondary pollutant. And ozone is formed from the combination of hydrocarbons, which are an example of a VOC, and that would be from the unburned fuel in a car engine, plus the nitrogen oxides in the exhaust, plus the sunlight. And this is very common in cities like LA. So in this case, um, ozone is the secondary pollutant and the HCs and NOx are the primary pollutants. So remember then, here's the summary of the two. Go ahead and pause and take that in if you'd like. The six criteria pollutants, you should definitely know these for the AP exam. They are pollutants that the EPA tracks closely like carbon monoxide, sulfur oxides, or NOx, nitrogen oxides, tropospheric ozone, not the stratospheric ozone, which is good ozone, particulate matter, and lead. So let's take a look at those. Carbon monoxide, it's a colorless, odorless gas from vehicle exhaust and other sources. It's dangerous because it prevents oxygen uptake, meaning that our blood can no longer hold the oxygen that it needs. Sulfur dioxide is also a colorless gas from coal burning for electricity and industry. It contributes to acid rain when it reacts with water to form sulfuric acid. And nitrogen oxide, sorry, nitrogen dioxide. This is a foul smelling red gas from vehicle exhaust um, and also from industry and electricity generation. It contributes to smog and acid rain when it reacts with water to form nitric acid. So we often talk about photochemical smog being kind of brownish. That's from the NOx. And then tropospheric ozone is also a colorless gas, a secondary pollutant, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's a component of photochemical smog, which is harmful to the tissues of organisms. It can basically irritate eyes and mucous membranes. If you're a leaf, it will irritate your leaves. Lead is a metal in the atmosphere and exists as particulates, mostly from a gasoline additive that was phased out in the 1980s. It has diverse health impacts, they're all bad. For example, impaired brain functioning, birth defects, and miscarriages. Lead makes gasoline perform better, which is why we would use it, but we then realized it was too toxic. And of course, particulate matter. Any solid or liquid particles small enough to be carried aloft in the air are called particulates. And this includes dust, soot, sulfates, and nitrates, and they all cause respiratory damage and can make asthma worse. The Clean Air Act was in 1970, that's when it really took effect. And you can see some of these changes before and after. Carbon monoxide emissions reduced by half, NOx reduced by about a third, VOCs by a half, sulfur oxides by a half, particulate matter by 80%, and lead by 99%. VOCs I think of as the missing seventh criteria pollutant. They are volatile organic compounds, a large group of potentially harmful carbon-containing chemicals Used in, used in industrial processes and household products, such as artificial scents. Anything that you're smelling basically is a volatile organic compound for the most part. 
um, artificial scents and things like that. New car smell for another example. Hydrocarbons from gasoline are one example. And about half are human made, half are natural, only some are regulated. And VOCs contribute to photochemical smog and produce secondary pollutants. If you're buying paint, you might look for low VOC paint that releases less toxic fumes when drying. Now let's take a look at industrial smog and photochemical smog. Smog is a funny word. It's a mixture of smoky and fog. So the U.S. had its own killer smog from industrial pollution. This is a place in Pennsylvania in 1948 at midday. Can you believe that? Subsequent demand for legislation against pollution made the U.S. air much cleaner. So industrial smog is smog from industrial pollution and fossil fuel combustion, mostly for generating electricity. This is the kind that blanketed London in 18, 1952, and it's also called gray air smog. And it contains soot, carbon, which is carbon particulates, sulfur, oxides, carbon, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, etc. Um, so we see here in this diagram that, um, yeah, basically we're just showing that you get sulfur oxides, and that can lead to sulfuric acid when it combines with water vapor. And with carbon, when you burn it, the carbon and oxygen combine to get CO2, ideally. Um, or if you have incomplete combustion because not enough oxygen, then you will get carbon monoxide. Mercury is a huge component of industrial smog. In fact, 80 tons of mercury are released into the atmosphere every year in the U.S. from coal-burning electric power plants, becoming deposited on soil, crops, lakes, and rivers. 80 tons. You can see which states are the worst. Texas is really bad. And uh, any place in the northeast of the, of the U.S. is going to be pretty bad. This is coal country. Um, we got West Virginia, lots of coal mines there. Coal is burned um, a ton for producing electricity. In California, we're pretty clean here because we don't use coal. We don't have coal. We do have natural gas that we collect off the coast, and we burn a lot of that. Half of our electricity comes from it. Mercury poisoning is pretty gnarly. Here's a classic case that happened in Minamata Bay in Japan when methyl mercury was released by a Japanese chemical company from 1932 to 1968, over 30 years. It caused a number of problems, including involuntary muscle contraction, numbness, impaired vision, insanity, birth defects, and even death. So these are some of the symptoms or effects of mercury poisoning. Now let's compare this industrial smog with photochemical smog. Here's Mexico City and many of the world's cities shown suffering from the brownish haze of photochemical smog. There are inversion layers in mountains that can trap the smog over certain cities, including LA. So test yourself, which of the following is not implicated in the formation of photochemical smog? When we say implicated, we mean involved in. So go ahead and pause. We'll come back. Let's take a look at your results. Sulfur oxide is the only one that's not. VOCs plus nitrogen oxides plus sunlight makes photochemical smog, which includes ozone, tropospheric ozone. The socks, these are more from burning coal. So you should definitely know what I just said. NO2 plus VOCs plus sunlight makes ozone and plus smog. Smog isn't really a chemical. Smog is just smoky fog. And we call this brown air smog. It's this, the nitrogen that gives the brownish. Here is um, LA. A hot sunny day in urban areas like LA create perfect conditions for its formation. And ozone, by the way, is not good stuff, um, as we talked about. Uh, let me go back. Let's try that again. Yeah, so this ozone, it's going to cause irritation to your eyes and your mucous membranes. If you're a plant, it's going to cause you to um, have stunted growth, probably die earlier, have yellow leaves, things like that. With the yellow leaves, you can't do photosynthesis as effectively. So test, test yourself. In a thermal inversion, which of the following is true? Multiple mark. OK, did you say high air is warmer than low air, therefore they don't mix? That's true. And smog is trapped below the warm layer. That is also true. Let's take a picture of this. Here you see um, Santiago, Chile, and these are all natural occurrences, just depending on the weather and some of the geologic features like mountains. Normally, 
The air lower is warmer because it's being warmed by the surface, therefore it rises, bringing with it the pollutants. But in some cases, you can actually get the air above being warmer and the air below being colder. And so they're already separated. There's no mixing happening. Um, and the pollution can get trapped underneath that layer. Go ahead and pause if you want to take that in. And then inversion layers often happen in LA. See in LA, we have a sea breeze, which is always cool. And we have these mountains. On the other side of the mountain, there's desert. Sometimes we have air coming in from the desert, so it's warm. And you basically have now hot air over cold air. There's no mixing. Because hot rises, cold sinks, they're already separated. Let's talk about acid rain a little bit here. So we also call it acid deposition. And it has killed these conifer trees in the mountains of North Carolina, where a lot of sulfur-containing coal is burned. The process here is, here you see the coal plants making electricity. They're putting out these two primary pollutants, SO2 and nitri nitric oxide. When they combine with water and oxygen and other oxidants in the air, we get sulfuric acid and nitric acid. When it rains, it's now acid rain. And notice how it can happen miles away from where the pollution originated. And you can see here, um, yeah, you can we'll just kind of hit the highlights here. Um, basically what we just talked about. But it has wide-ranging detrimental effects on ecosystems and buildings and statues. Let's take a look at this statue. What happened to her nose? It was dissolved by the acid. Lots of environmental ecosystem effects. I highlighted some for you that I think are, are most uh, important to know about. Number one is acid releases aluminum from soil. So you end up getting soil that's higher in aluminum and that hinders plant uptake of water and nutrients and plants readily die from that. That aluminum can now go into surface waters by the process of um, runoff or it could percolate through the soil until it finds its way into a local pond or a lake. So the key is elevated levels of aluminum in both soil and surface waters. And that aluminum can also kill plant, um, both plant and animal species. So you get reduced species diversity and abundance of aquatic life and negatively affect the entire food webs. So some species are more tolerant of low pH than others and they will survive, but overall diversity is going to decrease. And as we know, you take out some species and you affect the entire food web. Acidity varies geographically quite a bit. We have very little problem with this in California, in fact, for most of the Western US. But back in the East, where they burn coal a lot more, it's a significant problem. Although it is becoming less of a problem as we get better at cleaning our smokestacks. Um, so that they don't put out sulfur so much. So let's take a look at anti-pollution laws and technology. The Clean Air Act legislation was major. It was in 1970, and um, it set some pretty strict standards. Oh, let's go back there. It imposed emissions limits, provided research funds, and enabled citizens to sue violating parties. It was strengthened in 1990, same Clean Air Act, just kind of rewritten with some more details, some more regulations. And it also introduced something called emissions trading, which is called also cap and trade, where companies must buy permits that are good for an allowable amount of pollution. And if they pollute less, they can sell their unused permits to other companies. So you're buying the right to pollute, and you're selling that right if you end up not using all of that right. The Clean Air Act of 1970, we already saw this, just kind of a reinforcement. So acid deposition has improved. You can see that pH has risen um, becoming less acidic, so that's good. Go ahead and pause and see if you can match the clean air technology on the left with the pollutant it reduces on the right, and enter your answer choices in order. Okay, so hopefully you said one, three, and two. Well, let's take a look at these technologies. Here we see some smokestack scrubbers, and what they do is remove sulfur oxides. So you have these sulfur oxides from your combustion chamber. They go through the, um, the scrubber here. The scrubber is really, think of it like shower heads, shooting a mixture of water and calcium oxide, which is just a mineral you can mine from the earth. And while it's, while it's in this solution here, or while it's going through, 
The sulfur reacts with the calcium oxide to form a calcium sulfate slurry. And slurry is kind of like a powdery mixture. Um, uh, yeah, so it's kind of like uh, moist powder. And that you can then collect and put in a landfill or maybe find some other um, industrial use for it. That would be nice. Here we see electrostatic precipitators and their job is to remove particulates. And here's generally how they work. The gases come in, they go through these charged plates. Plates that are charged positive, negative, positive, negative. So there's an electric field between these plates. And the particles are attracted to the plates um, because of the electric field. And um, the plates are then vibrated, causing the particles to fall down into this ash collecting tunnel. And then from there, they can go into a storage silo. And then from there, maybe landfill or something. And uh, here we see a catalytic converter, which is something on cars, which are meant to reduce those primary pollutants that result in photochemical smog. And so every car nowadays has them. They started being used in the 1980s. And here's generally the idea. You have hydrocarbons, which is unburned fuel, also called VOCs, and carbon monoxide, which is fuel that has undergone incomplete combustion, not quite enough oxygen, otherwise it would be CO2. And here are your NOx, your nitrogen oxides. When they pass through, uh, we get further combustion. So the hydrocarbons get further burned into CO2 and H2O. The carbon monoxide gets further burned into carbon dioxide. And I'm not sure how this works, but the nitrogen oxide gets converted into nitrogen gas, which 79% of the air we breathe is nitrogen, so that's not a pollutant anymore. These things work awesome.